Okay, uh, so hi everybody and uh, thanks for turning up at this. Um, so this is just uh, something I've been working on for the last year or year and a half or so um, and kind of finally came to fruition uh, just kind of early summer. So this is, uh, it's still work in progress but I think it, it's in a state where I can, where I can explain it to people. Um, so Spare with me one second now. Okay, so just to really start off, I just want to show you a couple of things. Um, and it's just really motivated by the world that we live in. So um, I'm not sure if you can see this, but um, that's kind of the point of it as well. So what you just saw there was uh, about, I don't know, several thousand uh, starlings in a flock being attacked by a peregrine falcon. And there's a couple of things. First of all, each of those starlings is just uh, paying attention to about seven to ten of its neighbours. And yet they're able to react as a group of several thousand uh, individuals to a single attacker. Right, that's the first thing. So that's what's known as a complex adaptive system. The other thing is, is that when we watch that video, we're able to see what's going on. So we can actually interpret this blob of dots as if it was a single organism reacting dynamically to the particular attack and emergently forming some sort of a strategy. So there's actually several things going on, and this is kind of the hierarchy of these dynamics is it's not just the fact that the birds themselves are doing this it's the fact that when we look at that video we can understand and interpret even though we're looking at a, a couple of thousand dots we know exactly what's going on why they're doing it even though individually they're just reacting in a certain sort of a pre-programmed way that's the first thing and the second thing then is uh, from the world of humans uh, this is a sport that we're very proud of that's kind of a couple of thousand years old and I just want to show off this kind of a highlights clip of uh, some hurling so you can see here that these guys are able to basically treat a piece of wood as if it was an extension of their bodies they're able to do uh, enormously complex uh, dynamical uh, skills with a moving ball while running at full tilt uh, while being tackled by, by each other. They're able to score goals from a run over their shoulder from 90 or 100 yards. Um, and this is a, a game that's been played in Ireland for the last at least 2,000 years and uh, it's something that you really need to be start when you're about two or three in order to be able to achieve this level of skill. So the question is, what's going on? How do we do this? Okay. Now there's a couple of possibilities. One is that we do something along these lines. Now this is actually the uh, velocity and angle that you need to uh, hit a ball in volleyball in order to do a certain serve to get over the net and to deliver the ball at a certain point uh, on the other side. Okay. The only problem is 
we forgot drag. And this is one of the equations that you need to use in order to figure out what the coefficient, which is that kd, is, in order to put it into the equations. And then, just for the same problem, just this simple problem of a serve from a standing still position, you need to take into account these things, and these are the equations that you need. These are coupled differential equations that you need in order to figure out uh, what the effect of spin is going to be on where the ball ends up. So, possibly we're solving these differential equations, but it's highly unlikely seeing as these things were only developed in the last 15 or 20 years. So what we actually do is stuff like this, and stuff like this, and stuff like this. So, this is the real question about what it is that our brains are doing in order to apparently be doing all these differential equations and all these computations, whereas in fact we do none of those things directly. So luckily, there's a whole field of applied mathematics that has been developed since about the 1960s, mainly because we now have computers that can do all these calculations that don't require understanding uh, differential equations, or if they do, you just plug them in and these uh, libraries just solve them for you. So this is an example of a robot which uh, basically rides a bike, but it doesn't solve any equations. What it does is it just reacts to what's happening to itself and to the bike. So it just corrects for errors, effectively. I won't bother showing you that. And this is a quick video by uh, a guy called Sugihara, which is who's one of the leaders in this field. So I'm just going to let this speak for itself. So if you just watch this for, it's about three and a half, four minutes long. This is the Lorenz attractor. The Lorenz is an example of a coupled dynamic system consisting of three differential equations where each component depends on the state and the dynamics of the other two components. You can think of each component, for example, as being species, foxes, rabbits, grasses, and each one changes depending on the state of the other two. So these components, shown here as the axes, are actually the state variables or the Cartesian coordinates that form the state space. Notice that when the system is in one lobe, x and z are positively correlated, and when the system is in the other lobe, x and z are negatively correlated. The manifold m consists of the set of all trajectories, and phi is the flow on m defined by the coupled equations. m of t is a point on the manifold. We can view a time series, then, as a projection from that manifold onto a coordinate axis of the state space. Here we see the projection onto axis x and the resulting time series recording displacements of x. This can be repeated on the other coordinate axes to generate other simultaneous time series. So these time series are really just projections of the manifold dynamics onto coordinate axes. Conversely, we can recreate the manifold by projecting the individual time series simultaneously back into the state space to create the flow. In this panel, we can see the three time series x, y, and z each of which is really a projection of the motion on that manifold, and what we're doing is the opposite here. We are taking the time series and projecting them back into the original 3D state space to recreate the manifold, that butterfly attractor. There's a very powerful theorem proven by Floris Takens that shows generically that one can reconstruct a shadow version of the original manifold simply by looking at one of its time series projections. For example, consider the three time series shown here. These are all copies of each other. They are all copies of variable x. Each is displaced by an amount tau, so the top one is unlagged, the second one is lagged by tau, and the blue one on the bottom is lagged by 2 tau. Taken's theorem says that we should be able to use these three time series as new coordinates and reconstruct a shadow version of the original butterfly manifold. So let's see how this works. This is the reconstructed manifold produced from lags of a single variable, and you can see that it actually does look fairly similar to the butterfly attractor. Each point in the three-dimensional reconstruction can be thought of as a time segment with different points capturing different segments of history of variable x. And the reconstructed manifold is then a library or collection of the historical behavior of x. 
The reconstruction preserves essential mathematical properties of the original system, such as the topology of the manifold and its Lyapunov exponents. More importantly, this method represents a one-to-one -one mapping between the original manifold, the butterfly attractor, and the reconstruction, mx, allowing us to recover states of the original dynamic system by using lags of just a single time series. Taken's theorem gives us a one-to-one -one mapping between the original manifold and reconstructed shadow manifolds. Here, we will explain how this important aspect of attractor reconstruction can be used to determine if two time series variables belong to the same dynamic system and are thus causally related. This particular reconstruction is based on lags of variable x. If we now do the same for variable y, we find something similar. Here, we see the original manifold m, as well as the shadow manifolds mx and my, created from lags of x and y respectively. Because both mx and my map one-to-one -to, -one to the original manifold m, they also map one-to-one -to, -one to each other. This implies that the points that are nearby on the manifold my correspond to points that are also nearby on mx. We can demonstrate this principle by finding the nearest neighbors in my and using their time indices to find the corresponding points in mx. These points will be nearest neighbors on mx only if x and y are causally related. Thus, we can use nearby points on my to identify nearby points on mx. This allows us to use the historical record of y to estimate the states of x and vice versa, a technique we call cross-mapping. With longer time series, the reconstructed manifolds are denser, nearest neighbors are closer, and the cross-map estimates increase in precision. We call this phenomenon convergent cross-mapping and use this convergence as a practical criterion for detecting causation. Okay, um, so what that means in plain English is that if you have a system which is uh, operating in a chaotic regime, which is... Or Hold on, Fergal, YouTube is auto-playing. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. I hate, they added that like three months ago, and I hate it. Okay, you're back. Okay, uh, what it means in plain English is that you have a system and it's producing a time series of a signal of some description that's generated from the system and just using the time series you can reconstruct the important dynamics of that system okay that's effectively now what what the theorem in the middle of that video talks about which is Takin's theorem or Taken's theorem mathematically proves that this must be true of certain types of well-behaved systems but what people since 1980 or so in every maths department in the world in every university about if you go down and look at what they're studying they're studying this right they're studying the fact that these things can actually be managed in a non-analytic way so all you need is just data to come off this system and a suitable receiving modeling system can just extract the important information out of that and make forecasts and predictions even though the system that's being studied is highly complex and very chaotic and um, so this is the important thing and uh, there was actually a professor of applied mathematics at the new york city meetup and I went through this entire thing with him and he said, yeah, that's what we've been doing for the last 20, 25 years. So he guarantees that this is completely valid and this is what all these guys have been doing. The problem is that the mathematics of it is very complicated. So practically nobody else knows about it. But this is what all these guys are just studying all the time. So just to give you an example of that. Okay, so it's... This is the same sort of thing as you saw in the previous video. So it's a time lagged uh, X, Y, Z plot of the hot gym data. And to show you, I've done a similar thing where I've projected off graphs of the, um, I'm, not, I'm not able to see what you're seeing now. So I'm, I'm presuming you see it. So there's graphs going off on the X, Y, Z axes where you can see what looks like the familiar hot gym waveform. But 
essentially this is the same sort of thing and the idea is that uh, if you can the theorem says that if you can basically project that data into a high enough dimensional space and certainly a region of neocortex is going to give you a high enough the SDRs are high enough dimensional vectors that you can essentially take in that data absorb it and merge it with the dynamics of the of the region itself and perform this operation that these guys have been saying is uh, vital to how coupled dynamical systems work okay so that's essentially now can you tell me when that video finishes up it's just like a minute long yeah it's just finishing up now okay you're good okay so just to put that into perspective so I'm just going to just very quickly this requires now the prediction assisted CLA which is this type of a column where every cell has its own proximal dendrite that's the uh, that is the the one thing that that is required for this um, and just I'm just going to very quickly go through this so this is the the vector version of uh, pattern memory or spatial pooling and this is important because um, essentially what uh, what each column is trying to do when it uh, gets a feed-forward input is it's trying to approximate that input so the two uh, green vectors here are uh, close to the input so they have a lot of overlap in the in the HDM sense while these vectors here have much less overlap overlap or are perpendicular to it and these are the ones that participate in the SDR so you can imagine that given an input there's a kind of a cluster of uh, column representations that closely match that input okay so and then transition memory is then the same sort of thing and then when those two are mixed you get uh, uh, basically a, a current injection that is a mixture of both the feed forward input and the predicted input from the distal dendrites and then that's just the equivalent time to fire and this is really the key diagram about how that works so above you see there are a number of columns and in those columns there are a number of the green ones are basically where a cell has fired because it's predictive and the brown ones are uh, bursting columns so you can see that there's a sequence of the predictive columns firing first followed by the inhibition and then followed by bursting columns so if you follow the sequence of those you can see that there's a, a list of cells that fire first the green ones then there's a list of ones that are bursting and those form into this kind of sequence here which is pyramidal predictive cells inhibitory cells and then bursting cells and then inhibitory spreading cells and those form basically a vector which is a predictive vector and a perpendicular bursting vector and that's the signal that the that uh, layer of cortex is going to produce okay so when you translate that back into this dynamical system thing basically transition prediction is where a set of nearest neighbors are able to predict what's going to happen next in this kind of vector space of these uh, high dimensional manifolds and multiple predictions work very similarly so this is a a thing where two predictions are are uh, taking place and basically what they're doing is they're saying am I in one regime or am I in the other regime so obviously this requires a number of different layers in order to process it and this is the uh, the six layer model that uh, that this that this extension of the theory involves so the inputs this is obviously very familiar and uh, you know Jeff has shown a version of this uh, several times but the important thing is that what's happening is is that the the inputs are coming in going into L4 which is modeling the transition dynamics and then L23 is 
able to using temporal pooling and also by taking in the bursting inputs it's characterizing how that uh, how the dynamics of the of the inputs are changing and then that's feeding through to l5 which again forms a coupled dynamical uh, system with the motor output and then l6 is controlling all of these different activities by uh, either blocking or actually creating its own version of the inputs so for example l6 can shut off inputs and then drive l4 and drive the entire rest of the region to simulate forward and i think that's something that eric has been working on something very very similar to that so that's really the central uh, model that that this kind of extension really uh, characterizes so some of the things that this thing can do is obviously model states and transitions, which we all know about. Um, it can run a simulation forward by effectively uh, forming a feedback loop between L6, L4, L2, 3, L5, back to L6, and so on, um, under the governance of, of uh, top-down input from L1. Um, it can also characterize the dynamics of the system. So if, for example, the uh, the bird flock you saw when it was on its own without any predator had one type of dynamic whereas when it was being attacked it split into two or it buckled or whatever it did and we can see that and perceive that and that's going to happen in l2 because it's going to see that those there's going to be a shift of the dynamics in l4 we can also model the evolution of a non-stationary system that's the same sort of thing and that involves uh, L2, 3 going through a sequence of recognitions of what's going on in L4. And we can also extract chaotic signal from noise. And this is something, again, that comes very, very much from the applied maths guys. And um, we can also detect and measure causal relationships. And I think that was referred to in that video a bit. Um, but Sugihara has been, uh, it's actually called Sugihara causality, um, this metric. And you can do that directly uh, in a region of cortex. And you can also communicate between regions. And that's just simply by coupling the dynamics of different regions together. So for example, the default network in, uh, in the neocortex is basically about these things communicating with each other. And uh, Marcus and Williams have very extensive uh, work on that. And it's also about communicating between people because you can regard language as a time series of signals between the dynamical systems of the thoughts that I'm having at the moment and the dynamical system of the thoughts that you're having as a result of receiving the language. And that's also been, that's also been talked about. But very much in the abstract, these guys didn't really have a computational substrate to base this on. And this is really uh, the thing that I'm doing is to couple both the the neuroscience modeled using HTM to all the stuff that these guys have been talking about. Um, you can also obviously control your limbs, tools and mechanical devices. And you can do this in a very skillful way that involves uh, taking chaos and turning it into limit cycles and making sure that it's much more predictable. And you can do that using very low power uh, low bandwidth signals and uh, there's there's a lot of work on that as well with these guys okay so just to sum up the hypothesis is that the brain is just like a digital computer is a universal symbolic computer uh, I'm proposing that the brain is a universal dynamical systems computer and um, we now have a really good mathematical model for cortical function uh, layer 4 models the dynamics, layer 2 and 3 characterize the real world, layer 1 provides top-down context, layer 5 acts on the world, and layer 6 under this model is the operating system of the brain. So that's very much it. So there's some links to that. I'm doing a paper on that which is about 75% complete and I'd just like to thank Jeff and Matt and everybody there, uh, Richard and Rob, Felix and Marcus and Dave Ray for all their feedback on this stuff.
and uh, some of the other people around the place. And that's really it. So thanks very much. Thanks for all. Does anyone have any questions about Virgil's math? <laughs> about dynamical systems? Great. Hi, Fergal. Hi, Dan. Um, so I found myself during your presentation kind of scrambling to um, assemble the context around what you're saying. So what I'm saying is I, I'm trying to understand what the whole is that you're describing and then the role each part of what what you showed us plays in it. So the first diagram you showed a manifold which basically you're saying you can extract dimensionality from it um, and that the dimensionality you abstract has a pattern and maybe that those patterns are uh, offset in a window type fashion and then that those patterns can be replayed back and you can reconstruct uh, a version of the manifold from that. Now I'm trying to understand how that relates. First off, I don't know if that's correct, but you can tell me that in a second. But um, I'm trying to understand how that relates back to prediction assisted, you know, cortical uh, learning algorithms. Um, and then what that means in terms of what a dynamical system is. Um, so I mean, if you could kind of provide some, show me how those concepts are woven together and, and what they mean. Okay, so the, the idea is that of all possible worlds, all possible things that could happen, only a very, very small number of those things really do happen. Right. So, for example, if you drop, uh, if you drop a glass from six feet, it'll smash into millions of pieces. Okay. It's not going to, and those pieces will not reassemble. Okay. So, the world only works in a small number of ways out of all the possible ways that it could possibly work. Okay. And those things are now governed. We know by all these mathematical equations and by entropy and all this kind of stuff but evolution doesn't know that and our brains don't really understand that what we do is we learn the small subset of things that really happen in the world okay and we don't learn them by learning equations what we do is we learn by following how they evolve how we see them actually happening okay and the, the what the mathematics shows is that you can just do that. You don't need to understand what the equations driving the dynamical system are. A dynamical system just means it's some thing that has mathematics running it, deciding what happens next. But you don't need to know the mathematics. All you need to do is just watch the thing. And if you have a suitable apparatus in your head, then you can learn to build a model of that thing that works the same way as the thing itself. And that's what this Tacken's theorem proves mathematically for a certain small subset of these types of systems. But it turns out that these guys over the last 20 years, 25 years, every system they look at, this works, right? So you don't need to understand the exact details about how those things work. All you need to do is find some time series of metrics and be able to model those transitions and you'll be able to make forecasts and predictions. So, for example, in weather forecasting, this is the type of thing that they use. So the supercomputers doing weather forecasting no longer run these physical models. What they do is this type of prediction. They follow the dynamics, and they just use this type of time series reconstruction and, uh, and coupled uh, dynamical systems to do this. Right, so the weather forecasters are doing this because weather is really hard. Okay, and this is literally the state of the art in all of these types of systems. But nature discovered this 
millions of years ago, nature discovered that it didn't have to solve differential equations. It just had to build some way of sucking up the stream of information coming off these systems. And it just works. And the mathematics now shows that it does work. And what I'm saying is, is that that's why our brains are doing this and why we have L4 and L23 and L5 and L6 controlling it all. Yeah. So the, the point is you, you have to show the mathematics in order for people to believe it, right? And then get some professors and they'll say, yeah, that's all kosher, which I have done. And then you just need to trust it, right? Okay, because I don't understand any more than you do having watched this. I don't know the details of that stuff. But I do know that this actually is a true fact, that just by taking a time series of measurements from something, you can learn how it works. And that's exactly what we must be doing. Well, that's a fact. You're, you're hypothesizing that the brain is, operates as a dynamical system. That's, well, that's still a that's, hypothesis. Well, no, it's undoubtedly a dynamical system because every neuron is a dynamical system and every protein reaction in a protein pathway and every synapse is a dynamical system so well but but the way you defined it was anything that operates with math is a dynamical system I don't No, a dynamical I, system is just something that evolves over time in cert, in some sort of uh, deterministic way right and you know certainly everything that happens in your brain is one of those at every level you look at it's just that it's always too complex to model directly mathematically and so there's, there's, you know, there's no doubt about that and you know, this uh, half of neuroscience is, is based on treating neuroscience as a, as a dynamic, a complex adaptive system. You know, so but what I'm saying is, is that it's not about information in this step-by-step -step way and analysis, which is what the you know, good old-fashioned AI talks about. That's a construct that we put on the top of it, but only we're capable of doing that. What every mammal is doing with its neocortex automatically is just this process of uh, using a dynamical system to model a dynamical system, to interact with a dynamical system, to make predictions about it, and then coupling those together to perform cognition. You know, and these things just emerge, you know, like. Uh, Jeff has been, Jeff told me that Walter Freeman, who pioneered a lot of this idea, was talking to him about this 25 years ago. You know, so the, the, the problem is that he didn't really have a concrete computational substrate that we now have with HTM. Yep. Um, so I, I have a question. Um, uh, in, in, in both the uh, neuron models here as well as in HTMs, we don't see uh, implementation of uh, inhibitory neurons and uh, inhibition uh, seems to be an important part of the excitatory process. So w what are your thoughts? Why are inhibitory no neurons not modeled? Well, they are modeled in the formation of SDRs. You know, so they're, imp they're implicitly modeled in the, you know, in the local inhibition algorithm in, uh, in NUPIX HDM, for example, they are modeled. But the dynamics of them are not directly modeled. Now, my dynamics of those are much simpler. They're just a very, very small extension of what NUPIX is doing, for example. Right? Okay, and uh, Dave and I have been working on trying to get that working with HDM Java, so we might see it in NUPIX quite soon. Um, but it's, that's a very simple thing that isn't it's very much, very, very similar to what NewPic is currently doing. And NewPic is able to model this stuff directly, right? This is about taking a step-by-step, -step, kind of snapshot-by-snapshot -snapshot thing, which is a simplification of what's actually happening in, in real neocortex. But it's, this is good enough to do this. You know, you don't have to, you can, you can there are discrete versions of this that just work just as well. You know, but you, the, the dynamical modeling of inhibition and excitation is very, very complex. And I don't think it's like, it's what, like what Jeff was saying before, that you don't need to model every single detail of every single process that goes on in the neocortex in order to figure out what's going on. 
computationally. And the, the plan is to see, can we, can we show this happening using the step-by-step the -step thing that, that HDM uses? And I'm very confident that I can. And, and uh, there's been a lot of work in doing this using RNNs and using a whole lot of different other types of simplified neural, neural networks as well. They don't have the complexity that HDM has, the, the computational power that HDM has, and I think that's what's going to make the difference in establishing this using HDM. Hi, Fergal. Um, this is Matea. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So I've, I've got a couple questions for you. I actually um, read your paper on this, uh, and there's a couple questions that I had um, so, one thing is I'm I'm I only got to read your paper once, so uh, I I didn't do a really really deep but deep dive, but um, one thing I was wondering was uh, whether you have made any attempts to uh, do any proofs with the principles that you have um, that you've introduced uh, to prove the fidelity of the model uh, the mathematical model. And then uh, second is since you have introduced a system of axioms, uh, I'm I would be really curious to to know whether um, and I don't know if your upcoming paper is about this, but whether you're going to use those principles to uh, to conduct proofs of HTM uh, stability, robustness, uh, for example, um, and sparsity. Um, to, to prove that you know if you're if you're in a certain state and you get a certain sequence of inputs that some properties of HTM will be maintained. I think that's that's something that I have uh, really been lusting after for a long time, and uh, it, it would be great to see that be the next step. So, do do you have do you have that in in on your roadmap for uh, for this exploration? Well, I think that's already been shown. All I've all I've done really is to um, to show that is to provide a mathematical model for HTM, right? So given the mathematical model, and, and it's just literally derived from the algorithms, right? So you can look at the code, and you can see that you're doing a vector dot product, for example, when you're doing SP. Yeah, so, and when you do the learning on that, all you're doing is just heavy and learning on that. You're just adjusting the permanences on that, and you're increasing the probability of uh, a match between a single column's uh, connection vector and an input vector, and you're just improving the match, right? So there, it's inherently stable, and there's loads of results that show that when you have a system like that, and you add in a K winner takes all uh, algorithm to that, I think that's referred to in, in part of that first paper, that it can do any binary computation you like. So there's proofs of that, and it's also one of the most efficient ways of doing it in a single layer. And you'd have to do it in a multi-layer network, and that would have much lower stability. So all those results are well known once you can characterize what the mathematics of HTM are, which is what that first paper is really all about. You know, so I did, like other people have proven all of those things. So I could I could probably dig up some of those results, but like there's there's no doubt and. Uh, I just saw a talk by Hinton, who keeps on uh, inadvertently veering towards what we're doing, and he has an entire thing about uh, how his type of model can be replicated without backpropagation using very similar ideas to what I'm talking about, which is the top-down feedback. I mean, stuff that uh, Jeff and co. have developed, but this is um, there's a closer bridge to it. Um, but Hinton has shown that all of these things work as well, you know, and he actually has some results based on his uh, more neural model, which is very, it just looks more and more like uh, HTM every time he uh, comes out with a talk. Any other questions for Fergal? How much time do we have to ask? Uh, oh, it's, we're running late. We're past time. Um, Virgil, we wish you were here. Sorry you couldn't make it. Me too, very much. Um, thanks, thanks for connecting with us and giving you giving this talk. Um, the rest of the talks are not going to be remote. They're all going to be here. So I, I need five minutes to switch my configuration a bit.
and we'll probably do Subutai, Felix, and Subutai is just going to be a whiteboard talk yeah, talk I don't session. Have prepared, yeah, so but if you guys have yeah, but he's willing to go over you know for ten or fifteen minutes the current research state of uh, yeah we were talking about what's what's happening in research it wouldn't be bad to do um, is anyone interested in that seeing what's happening in research okay so I'll just pull the whiteboard over here and we'll set him up and then we'll pro probably do uh, Felix Chand and Sergey and I'll go last as time permitting so uh, give me five minutes and um, y you guys online um, I'll keep everything up and running but I'm gonna but you guys should keep muted and I'm gonna turn the audio I'll put off here, but thanks everybody. Thanks Richard and Fergal. Bye. Thanks very much, Okay.